Today we're going to be talking about the activity series, uh, another tool that can be used when trying to learn and understand about redox or reduction oxidation reactions. So here's a quick list of learning objectives that we're going to cover in the video itself. Uh, first we'll talk about what, a, what causes a redox reaction actually to happen. All chemical reactions are driven by certain forces acting within the chemistry. Our job is to identify what those forces are in a redox reaction. We'll then talk about something known as reduction potentials, which is the answer to that first question. These will be the four sets of play here. And last but not least, all of this information will be summarized in something known as the activity series. Uh, the activity series is a table, and actually this is one version of that table here. Uh, you'll need to find a copy of this at the bottom of the page and download this to have in your notes. Uh, but we'll talk about what a definition of the activity series is, and then ultimately how this activity series can be used to predict if a redox reaction will or will not occur. Just like when we looked at precipitation reactions, we use solubility rules to decide if a precipitate will or will not form. So we'll begin with the discussion of what causes an actual redox reaction to occur or not. And redox reactions are limited by each atom's ability to hold on to their electrons. If you recall, in a redox reaction, there is an exchange of electrons from one atom to another. If one atom's pull on those electrons is not great enough to overcome the other atom's pull, the exchange cannot occur, and as a result, the reaction cannot occur. So if the chemical being reduced, the one that gains electrons, pulls harder on electrons on the electrons than the chemical being oxidized, the one that loses electrons, then it has the ability to pull those electrons off of the atom and cause a reaction to occur. So again, just to recap, the chemical being reduced, the one that's trying to gain electrons, pulls harder on those electrons than the one that's supposed to lose them. This reduced chemical can pull the electrons off, the reaction happens, and as a result we get our redox reaction. If that can happen, if this pull by the reducing substance is um, not great enough, uh, then as a result of that, no reaction will occur because neither atom has the ability to take electrons off of the other one, which again, if you recall, is the driving force behind a redox reaction. So to get more specific then, we can talk about the actual measured value or the force that causes this to occur. And what are those are known as are reduction potentials. Uh, hopefully the word potential is something you remember from physics from last year. Uh, it's a sort of form of potential energy or the ability to do some sort of work. Uh, so what reduction potentials are is then just listed right here. It is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons or to be reduced. The stronger your reduction potential is, the better you are at being reduced, which means the better oxidizing agent your particular substance actually is. This is measured in volts, just like the potentials from back in physics are, uh, sometimes in millivolts when you're dealing with smaller substances. And there's values we can have for that. The symbol we typically use for our reduction potentials is this E sub H value. Uh, if those E sub H values are positive, this means an attraction on electrons, and that means your substance is more likely to be reduced, or it is a better oxidizing agent. And if the reduction potential is negative, that means this substance repels electrons. It's more likely to be oxidized or lose them, meaning it's a better reducing agent. Uh, so the magnitude of the number and the sign gives us an idea of whether it will be oxidized or reduced and how good it is at doing that. Remember, bigger number equals stronger oxidizer or stronger reducing agent. Uh, positive or negative tells us which is which. Basically then, what we're able to do now is we're able to compare reduction potentials in different atoms to see if a redox reaction will occur. It's a way of doing what we talked about previously of comparing how well this atom pulls on electrons versus how well that atom holds onto its own ones. Is there enough of a difference in those forces that one atom can take electrons from the other? If we were doing this in a more technical kind of way, we could actually use the actual reduction, or the reduction potential values, and there's some math that goes along with that. However, we can take all of this math and science and simplify it down to something known as the activity series. So what the activity series is then is a list of elements or ions in order of decreasing reduction potentials. And the key word here is decreasing. By putting the elements in order, we can look at where an atom or ion shows up on the list, and we can comparatively say whether it has a stronger or weaker reduction potential than atoms above it or below it. Uh, so ultimately then, this is a tool that can be used to predict if a reaction will, compare, will occur between two different compounds. If a substance is higher on the list, 
it is easier to oxidize. Uh, the more easily something is oxidized, the more likely we'll get a reaction to occur. The lower things are on the list means they are more difficult to oxidize and they are less likely to react. So more and less is probably the things I should have underlined here uh, as opposed to circling the word react. Um, now we're going to limit our, um, our activity series table to looking just at metals and when you're dealing with just metals these statements make a whole lot of sense. So we'll say over here this is for metals only. If you were going to be looking at a larger table of uh, activity series things, we'd actually have to generalize things a little more and this less and more likely to react statements might not be quite as accurate. So here's an example of what an activity series table can look like. Uh, what it's basically showing you is the oxidation reactions of a bunch of different elements. We list the elements of the metal here in this column. We show the actual oxidation half reaction, lithium turning into lithium plus one, potassium and turning into potassium plus one. And again, these guys are listed in order of ease of oxidation. The higher up on the table are, the easier they are to oxidize, and the more likely these substances are to react in a metal reaction or single replacement, the ones in the bottom are less likely to occur. And as we already said, this table can be used to predict if or if not a reaction will occur. The way we use it, and this is the part you need to be very careful about, write these down carefully. Uh, the element that is to be oxidized in a single replacement reaction, that's always going to be the element in the reaction. There will always be something that's an element. When that thing is going to be oxidized, you've got to find that on the periodic table. So find it listed, or on the activity series table. You're also going to need to find the element that's going to be reduced, which in case of metal again reactions, it's typically the ion in your single replacement reaction. So you'll find the elements that's listed here and the ion to predict whether or not a reduction oxidation reaction will occur if the element is higher on the list than the ion, you will get a reaction. If it's the other way around, if the ion's higher on the list, then you get no chemical reaction. And again, the way we're able to simplify this down to such a simple statement is simply by putting these guys in that correct order. It allows us simply to compare height on the table. Knowing they're in order of reduction potentials, we can then use that height as a way of comparing whether or not there is enough of a force to pull electrons off or not. So we're going to go through uh, a couple examples just to show you how this works. Um, before we get into this, if it hasn't already been obvious, you're going to need a copy of this uh, activity series table. Uh, there's a link down below at the bottom of the page where you can download this particular one. However, there are tons of these tables available online. Any one of those tables will get the job done. They all kind of work in the same kind of way. They all have very similar elements to the ones listed here. We're going to start by taking a look at these two examples here. Uh, in this case, we're going to ask whether or not uh, the reaction between magnesium and copper chloride is going to produce a product or not. So again, we've got to identify the element on the periodic table, which in this case is the element magnesium. That's you're looking for the thing with an oxidation state of zero. And we're going to identify magnesium up here on the table itself. Generally speaking, magnesium is fairly high up, which means it has a relatively high ease of oxidation. Since it's the metal that typically gets oxidized, that's a good indication that this reaction is going to go forwards. However, we also have to look for the ion. In this case, the ion is the copper ion. This is copper plus two in this scenario. And copper shows up way down here on the table. So we said before, if the element, magnesium, is above the ion, copper, then a reaction will occur. There will be an exchange of electrons. We'll end up forming magnesium. Now, if you look on your periodic table, the only other possible charge for magnesium is positive 2. And you can actually see that here as well. It turns to magnesium positive 2. So that'll make magnesium chloride, MgCl2, and it'll form copper metal with a charge of 0. Uh, and in this case, this single replacement redox reaction will indeed occur. We can continue this uh, discussion with a second reaction, uh, gold metal reacting with hydrochloric acid. Uh, you'll notice uh, again over here on the right, or on the left I mean, gold shows up way over here on the bottom of your table. Uh, remember going up means ease of oxidation, means gold is one of the most difficult metals to oxidize. That is not a good situation that we're already in. HCl, we always have hydrogen. You notice it's highlighted in a different color here. Whenever we're dealing with something reacting with acid, which is very common, we use the hydrogen line. Remember, the element has to be above the ion. This is our element with an oxidation state of zero. This is our ion with an oxidation state of positive one. In this case, the ion is above the element, which means in this case we will have no reaction. And that is actually one of the properties that gold has. It does not react with many other substances. 
That is one of the reasons it's such a valuable uh, substance, aside from its aesthetic value. Uh, gold is very often used in electronics and high-intensity type of scenarios where you need a substance that is very resilient to chemical exposure. You might have noticed things like satellites, for example, being wrapped in gold foil. That gold foil is a very high-resilience kind of covering that you can put on a satellite that's going to prevent it from being damaged by some of the ionizing radiation that occurs out in space. That brings us to the end of our video on uh, the activity series. At this stage in the game, you should be able to describe the forces that cause or prevent a redox reaction from happening. And those forces basically boil down to this particular idea, reduction potentials. You should be able to describe to me what reduction potentials are. I don't expect you to look them up. I don't expect you to do any work with reduction potentials. Simply that they are the driving force or the tendency of an atom to pull electrons away from other atoms, which is what a redox reaction really is. And last but not least, and probably most important of the three of them, you should be able to use the activity series in order to predict if a redox reaction will occur simply by using the table itself along with the simple rules that we created here in the video.